Hey everybody, this is Locked On Nitty Lions, your Penn State podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Kevin McGuire. Happy to be with you here once again on this Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. It was a beautiful day yesterday. We'll hope that weather continues on wherever you may be. And we have a lot to get into in today's episode. We're going to take a look at the latest AP Top 25 rankings for men's basketball as Penn State continues to climb in the AP poll. They've got a big game tonight against Illinois, and they are gaining a lot of respect from the people that put together those brackets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in today's episode. And we also will take a look at something that came out of the ACC as far as the future of the transfer rules concerned and we'll be talking about the ESPN preseason FPI which was very favorable towards Penn State and we've got a comment from Facebook that we're going to dive into as well so again a loaded episode today make sure you're subscribed so you never miss a single one of these episodes on your favorite podcasting apps such as iTunes and Google Play Spotify Stitcher Radio iHeartRadio subscribe rate and review we appreciate the feedback and it does help with the show's growth on those various podcasting apps so we appreciate the support any way you can share it with us we also want you to be a part of the show so make sure you follow us on twitter at locked on nittany check us out on facebook at facebook.com slash locked on nittany send us your questions send us your comments we'll get into them on the podcast just as we will later in this episode today so with all that out of the way and a lot to get into let's go ahead and get started Start our podcast today talking some Penn State men's basketball. The latest AP Top 25 came out on Monday, and your Nittany Lions have moved all the way up to number nine in the AP poll. It is tied for the highest ranking in the AP Top 25 in program history. The only other two times that that has happened was most recently in the 95-96 season, and then the uh, before that was 1953-1954 season. So. We continue to talk about rarities with the Penn State basketball program. We don't know if this is a flash in the pan or this is really going to become the new norm for this program. Again, I don't know what to make of this right now. I do think, historically speaking, it's probably reasonable to think that this is a little bit of a flash in the pan, but why not enjoy that flash in the pan if that's going to be the case? Uh, Live in the moment, and that is certainly something that this team seems to be identifying with. Uh, They are seizing their opportunities. They're taking advantage of everything that's in front of them right now and they continue to be putting themselves in a really good position as we get closer and closer to the month of March. Now, Penn State's going to have a game tonight in the Bryce Jordan Center against Illinois. It's a game that Penn State should win the way that things have been going. They just continue to rack up wins. Coming off a win against Northwestern over the weekend, Illinois is obviously going to be a little bit tougher, but Penn State has developed a little bit of a home court advantage. So we'll see if the Nittany Lions can continue their role tonight. They won't play again until, I believe, it's Sunday afternoon against Indiana. But you got to tune in to check out Penn State men's basketball team tonight against Illinois. You're going to get that game, I believe, at 6.30 p.m. on Fox Sports 1. And FS1 is going to be doing something a little bit unique with their broadcast tonight. Uh, So I don't know if it's really something you want to for this program right now but they're going to have the live mics and they're going to go commercial free i guess uh no commercial breaks so i guess you get a chance to uh hear some of the conversation that's going on on the benches in those timeouts during the game should be pretty interesting and i think it certainly follows up what the xfl has been doing their first couple weeks so having some live mics on the field and obviously no in-game interviews with the coaches or players but uh, I do think that that should be pretty interesting to hear Pat Chambers coaching his guys up uh, for this Big Ten contest again Penn State continues to be putting themselves in really good position we're getting closer and closer to the Big Ten tournament of course if the Big Ten tournament was starting today they would have the number two seed overall Uh, only other team in front of them would be Maryland and uh, who would have thought that at the beginning of the season? Yeah, obviously, there are always some eternal optimists uh, for any team, any program, any franchise out there. Uh, you know, there's probably somebody out there who says, oh, I could have pictured this happening. But the, the way that this college basketball season has been going, and I had a conversation with the work at work with someone about this, uh, you, why not Penn State right now in the Big Ten? Uh, certainly, you know, we'll see where they go between now and the end of the regular season, but uh, they are gaining more and more respect. The bracketologists are starting to get busy right now, and you're starting to see Penn State getting some 
some pretty lofty seating, uh, as you would expect for the number nine team in the country. Uh, Mike DeCourcy ha- of the Sporty News has Penn State as a number two seed out in the West bracket. That would be the bracket that has number one uh, seed Gonzaga. Uh, <laughs> that's that is remarkable to just uh, think about. Right now, we are sitting here on February eighteenth, and there are ba- college basketball experts out there suggesting that Penn State is a number two seed. I don't think they'll climb as high as number one, but getting a number two seed would be huge, especially the way this team has been playing. So uh, if you can get a number two seed, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Odds are that they're probably setting themselves up pretty well to be a pretty safe bet for at least a no less than a three seed. But again, still some work to be done. There's a lot of good stuff going on right now at Pat Chambers and that men's basketball program. And you'll get a chance to see them again tonight against Illinois, 6.30 p.m. on FS1 with the live mics and no commercials. Take a look at the uh, top 25, though, uh, in the men's basketball poll from the AP. Number one uh, team is still Baylor, Gonzaga at number two. And as I just mentioned, you've got Mike DeCourcy with uh, Penn State as a number two seed in Gonzaga's region out west. Uh, So that gives you an idea of where Penn State stands here as far as he's concerned. Kansas at number three, San Diego State at number four, Dayton at five, Duke at six, and then Maryland, your Big Ten leader right now, at the number seven spot in the AP Top 25, followed by Florida State, and then Penn State moving up from 13 to number nine, just ahead of Kentucky. Louisville falls from number five down to number 11. Villanova moves up a couple spots from number 15 up to number 12. Penn State is still the highest ranked team in the state of Pennsylvania. Just something to keep in mind there. But you know, a couple spots ahead of Villanova. I'm sure Pat Chambers is loving that, the former Villanova assistant. Auburn at number 13, Oregon at 14, Creighton at 15, Seton Hall 16, West Virginia 17, Colorado 18, Marquette 19, Iowa, another Big Ten team at number 20, followed by Butler at 21, Houston at 22, BYU at 23, Arizona at 24, and the Ohio State Buckeyes at number 25. Uh, BYU and Arizona and Ohio State were all unranked a week ago. They are now into the top 25. So I said yesterday in the podcast, uh, it was probably going to help Penn State's ranking with Seton Hall losing over the weekend. Uh, Seton Hall fell from number 10 all the way down to number 16. I wasn't sure how far Louisville was going to fall, but obviously they took a tumble going from number five down to number 11. And uh, Auburn actually uh, dropped two spots from number 11 to number 13. So a mixture of all those combinations of uh, teams losing while Penn State continue to win games. That's how you get it done. That's how you move up those rankings. And we'll see if uh, Penn State can keep it rolling. We've reached a point of the offseason where different conferences are going through their winter meetings, which of course will lead to their spring meetings, which will lead to their conference media days and summer meetings. And somewhere in between, you're going to get NCAA meetings with uh, the rules committee and uh, just other areas of the NCAA that review potential changes to the upcoming structure uh, for football, basketball, all the athletic departments that are out there. But, of course, we'll focus more on the football rule changes that are forthcoming uh, when we get a chance to review what those rule changes are going to be. But an interesting development came out on Monday with the ACC making a statement supporting the idea of a free one-time transfer for all student-athletes. So uh, football players, basketball players, soccer, lacrosse, wrestling, you name it, if you're a student-athlete, The ACC would like to endorse you having the option of going ahead and having that one-time transfer where you don't have to wait out a year before you're ruled eligible to play once again. And this is a huge development. This is a huge step forward if you are in favor of players having a little bit more power to decide where they're going to play, when they're going to play. And uh, just the transfer process is becoming a little bit more relaxed in favor of the players. And this would be a huge step forward. It also would follow in the footsteps of what the Big Ten has already kind of set the path for. A year ago, as it was reported, I believe, by CBS Sports recently, the Big Ten made this proposal to allow players to have a free one-time transfer. And it was just something that kind of got tabled while the NCAA spent a little bit more time discussing it, reviewing it. We're trying to determine if this is really something that should be a priority. Now, 
I believe that it is. I think it's uh, always a benefit to go ahead and do things that are going to be uh, more helpful for the student athlete to make the power, to have the power to choose what they're going to do with their lives. Uh, I've always been in favor of this. I've always thought that a player should be able to transfer, play for whatever school they are able to get into. Uh, I don't think a coach should limit or restrict where that player can or cannot transfer to. I've always thought that that was ridiculous. And I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. But as far as getting a chance to transfer and play immediately, if you're able to do so, I think you should be able to do that. And I know that there's the, the big the big concern that a lot of people will have is does this mean that we're basically going to, going to have free agency in college sports? Well, yeah, I, we have seen the number of transfers really kind of pick up. I don't have the data, so I can't say definitively that there are more transfers now than there used to be. Although it certainly feels that way, and getting a chance to cover the transfer portal news on a regular basis for NBCSports.com on College Football Talk. I certainly feel as though we're talking about transfers much more frequently. And I think uh, they've been highlighted by some of the quarterbacks that have changed schools from one school to another over the recent years. And they're always going to be in the spotlight. But these we're seeing transfers for players of all positions. So as you may or may not know, when a player tr- under the current rules transfers from one FBS school to another FBS school, for example, uh, a player transferring from Penn State to let's say Washington, that player would have to sit out a full season of football before they are able to continue with their eligibility the following year. So if somebody is transferring 2020 from one FBS program to another, they're going to have to sit out the upcoming 2020 season and they'll be able to play again in 2021. This ultimately costs any student athlete a year of their eligibility, whether they have four years and they've, they're burning one year or they have that red shirt option. You would basically burn your red shirt uh, while sitting out a year. So it's not always a bad situation if you had that red shirt flexibility. But but a lot of players transfer after already using their redshirt year. So you're actually losing another year of eligibility on the football field or on the basketball court. And obviously waivers can be uh, filed and accepted by the NCAA, although um, they're trying to to limit exactly how many waivers they approve. But the, the, the idea that the Big Ten proposed last year, and now it seems like the ACC is fully on board with, is removing that one year where you have to sit out a season. And I think that that would be a fantastic development. Uh, again, I, I believe that a player should be able to transfer from one school to another and not have to sit out any time. And I think what we're going to pay attention to moving forward, at least throughout the winter and leading into the spring meetings is, What other power conferences are going to be on board with this? We still have to hear from the Pac-12, the Big 12, and the big one would be the SEC. I imagine that there is going to be a positive uh, movement here for changing the rule the way that the Big 10 and now the ACC are on board for. I don't think there's going to be a lot of concern from some of these other conferences. I don't know if you'll have the unanimous uh, reaction like the ACC says that they had, but I do think that there's going to be an overwhelmingly positive reaction Uh, reaction from some of these other conferences moving forward. The one conference I think might be the sticking point might be the SEC. I don't know, uh, but I do think that there's enough progressive-minded people in charge in the SEC (laughs) that would uh, potentially help move that cause forward. So if you get three power conferences on board, uh, you're very likely to have some kind of change made because I do think that there would be some uh, other conferences that would kind of join that movement as well. I don't know if there's any conference that would be saying no to this, uh, but it's certainly something to just keep an eye on as we move forward. I do think that this is going to be a reality, and I think it's going to be a reality relatively soon. So I thought it was good to see the ACC uh, come out with their statement saying that they unanimously endorse the idea of the one-time transfer rule being uh, uh, implemented for all student athletes. I think that'd be great. You would still have to wait out another year if you decided to transfer a second time, but removing that for your first transfer, I think that should be an automatic win for everybody involved. So we'll see what happens with the Big 12, the SEC, and the Pac-12 when we find out some more information from those conferences. But for right now, Big 10 and the ACC, I think are moving things in the right direction. 
ESPN released their preseason FPI for college football. That's their football power index on Monday. And I'll be blunt with you guys. I don't pay attention to FPI. I don't really care about it. I think it's a manufactured stat that they get a lot of play out of. And I don't really like buying into that. But you know what? We're going to buy into it right now. We're going to give ESPN exactly what they want and talk about the FPI. Because I know a lot of people out there that listen to this podcast probably do pay attention to it. And like I said, I think it's just a made-up stat that ESPN likes to brag about and show off to to really drive the conversation. And you know what? It's working because here we are talking FPI on February 18th in 2020, uh, so looking ahead to the college football season. And I do this because it's uh, looking pretty optimistic as far as Penn State's concerned. So like I said, I don't get too carried away with it, but we'll address it real quick before we move on. Uh, the preseason and FPI comes out from ESPN and it is very optimistic about Penn State. It's got Penn State at number five in their preseason FPI rankings. The only four teams ahead of them are number one, Clemson, number two, Ohio State, number three, Oklahoma, and number four, Alabama. No real surprises there. Obviously, Clemson is not going anywhere, even though they just lost the national championship game. Ohio State is always going to be the team to beat in the Big Ten for the foreseeable future. And Oklahoma is always going to have that offensive uh, number in their favor. And Alabama is Alabama. Alabama is not going anywhere. I know they missed the playoff last year, but Alabama is not going anywhere. Uh, And to come in right behind Alabama... That's not a bad spot for Penn State to be in, and I think it does show that there is a there's a lot of good things going on at Penn State, and whatever metric you use to measure that, it's showing that progress is being made with the Nittany Lions. Other teams in the top ten coming in behind Penn State at number six is Wisconsin, uh, another team that could be in store for a pretty good year this upcoming season. Number seven, Texas, So and number eight, Texas A&M. So already, get ready for an offseason of uh, Texas and Texas A&M hype. It's starting right here with this preseason FBI that a lot of people are going to get carried away with. Uh, followed by number nine, Notre Dame, and number 10, Georgia. Georgia is always going to be a, a strong team, I think. Uh, Notre Dame is uh, looking like they could have a pretty decent year as well. So Penn State is uh, projected to have the fifth best offense per the FPI preseason ranking and the 10th best defense. That's not bad. That's a good combination to have. Again, if you pay attention to this metric, uh, Penn State having the fifth best offense, that's something that I think is uh, something that we could look forward to. I've discussed this on the podcast before. They need the wide receivers to step up, but they've got a new offensive coordinator. They've got some new offensive coaches, including a new wide receivers coach. Uh, get those wide receivers to get in gear. They've got one of the best tight ends, best tight ends in Pat Fryermuth. They've got a really solid running game. I think Sean Clifford's going to come back and learn from some of his uh, experiences from the 2019 season. I think there's a lot of optimism to be had about this Penn State offense and this metric right here that ESPN uses. That certainly backs it up. So again, I don't get too carried away with it, but it's it's encouraging to see, I think, as you get ready for the next season. Obviously, there are some big hurdles in front of Penn State to get to that next level. Uh, you know, Ohio State is still a, a beast. <laughs> you know, even though they send a number of players off to the NFL, they are a very strong team. You know, Clemson is uh, has established themselves as a pure dominant power in college football. Oklahoma is going to have the offense, but you never know exactly if that's going to be enough to keep up with some of these other top teams out there, as it hasn't in the playoff era just yet. And of course, Alabama, even after a rel- quote down season last year, they're going to be a very strong threat as well. So, uh, you know, Penn State looking like they're going to have some good. Uh, some good numbers in their favor going into the season, however you want to break it down. I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about Penn State going into the next season, certainly with that offense. So this is uh, the ESPN preseason FBI kind of backs that up. We're going to close out this podcast by taking a reading from a comment left on the Facebook page. So go ahead to facebook.com slash locked on Nittany. You can send in messages at any time, whether you've got a comment that you want to share on the site or just a question in general. This is a lengthy one that comes from Tom on the Facebook page. Uh, So bear with me. It says recruiting question for you. Maybe you could talk about on the next podcast. There is no question. Penn State is doing well in recruiting, but they're definitely in that second tier of great but not elite, and it feels like maybe some of that new coach buzz is wearing off. I personally think Coach Franklin does a much better job of scouting than than developing these guys once they get on campus and he gets credit for. But Coach talks about wanting to win a championship, which likely means needing to regularly break into the top 10 on the 24-7 composite. What needs to change or happen to get there? Another Big Ten ring? One thing I think 
isn't talked about a lot is the dominant the state tagline dominate the state tagline franklin had initially used when he got here if you look at the pa composite rankings of the top five seven pa players lately he hasn't done that i know they have a lot of, of effort in florida and it's paying off but i don't think you can rely on getting enough guys from the south to want to come up here good comprehensive thought from Tom and we've sort of touched on some of these things before on the podcast when it comes to recruiting and putting together the best class you possibly can that's one key ingredient of course you have to keep those players on campus which Penn State has struggled with as far as the five-star players are concerned over the last year or two but overall, I think Penn State is putting together recruiting classes that are certainly good enough to put together some really good Big Ten contenders. Uh, again, Ohio State is the the gold standard that everybody is chasing right now. And you look at the way that Urban Meyer started the recruiting there, certainly stepped up his game there. And that's going to continue, I think, with Ryan Day. At least it certainly has in the first couple of years with Ryan Day as the head coach. And the big difference that Ohio State has had has been they have the playmakers that you need to take that next step at very key positions that Penn State has typically struggled with, most notably wide receiver. Ohio State may not have the best wide receivers out there, but they've got guys that are going to make plays uh, for them, which uh, Penn State has seen firsthand just how vital that is. Ohio State has those wide receivers that are going to catch the football and do some damage, while Penn State doesn't necessarily have those guys that are going to come up big in the clutch. So that is a huge thing that Penn State needs to do. I do agree, though. I think James Franklin gets uh, doesn't get quite the amount of credit that he probably should. I think that that's starting to change, though. I think as you see more and more players actually going off to the NFL and having success the way that they are, uh, and not just Saquon Barkley, I, I think that that narrative is starting to change a little bit. And it's going to help when James Franklin wins a few more games against ranked opponents, wins games on the road, uh, beats Ohio State. And those are the things that you really need to to start changing the image that uh, a lot of people seem to still have. Again, I think James Franklin needs to get a lot more credit for what he is doing and cut a little bit of slack for the things that he's not doing. I'm not saying that he's perfect coach. I've said before, there is room for improvement, and that's a good thing. I, I think you can always aspire to be something a little bit better, and I think that that's what James Franklin is still trying to do with this program. I still see that there are signs of progress, and we'll see what happens this upcoming season. But getting back to the dominate the state thing, that is something I kind of want to touch on because you know not every year Pennsylvania is going to have some of the top elite talent. I mean, if you're going to put together the best roster, that those best players may not come from Pennsylvania. They may not come from New Jersey. You may have to reach a little bit further out. You know, things can certainly be cyclical, uh, but I think you know certainly when James Franklin started at Penn State, he he made the case to keep all this top in-state talent as close to home as possible. And uh, that worked for some players. But as time goes on, you kind of move on from that. You bring in new coaches that have maybe different recruiting pipelines that they can work with. Um, you know, Certainly, uh, there's a lot of really good talent down south. And you're not going to lure a lot of it up north into Pennsylvania unless you're winning games. So it all kind of goes hand in hand. If you win games and you have a chance to win national championships and you're sending players off to the NFL doing the kinds of things that they are, those are the things that over time you're going to you're going to bring in some really good players from any part of the country. But certainly when you're a new head coach at a program like Penn State, uh, you want to do things, you want to say things that are going to sound good. And uh, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing that James Franklin did, but he certainly he came in. He had a mission that he was going to uh, restore the pride in this program, which at, it, at, that, at the time was desperately needed. <laughs> and I think that there was uh, it was a good recruiting tool to move forward with. Uh, but times have moved on. Times have changed. This program has grown. And I think James Franklin and his staff continue to flex their wings a little bit wider and try to get the best talent possible. So. You know, obviously, you would like to see some of the top players in Pennsylvania stay at Penn State, but ultimately, if you're getting really good talent from other states, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, we'll see how this all plays out. Maybe I can bring in someone who's uh, more in keen with the the recruiting process out there. But in my mind, I don't think it's really that much of a negative that you need to worry about too much. 
And with that, we are going to wrap up this episode of the Locked On Nittany Lions podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Make sure you check out all the podcasts we have available on the network. We cover all of your favorite teams, whether the NFL, NHL, NBA, baseball season's getting ready to go. So we have lots of content all around the network for you guys, for whatever your team may be. Right here on this podcast, though, we do talk Penn State football and some other Penn State sports topics as well. So make sure you're subscribed and never miss a single episode by subscribing on your favorite podcasting app, such as iTunes and Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and we have got the RSS feed. So anything I didn't mention, you can add that RSS feed right to your favorite podcasting app so you never miss a single episode as soon as they become available. And of course, if you want to help us out a little bit more, you can leave a rating and leave a review. We appreciate the feedback, and it does help promote the show on those various podcasting apps moving forward into the year 2020. And of course, we also want you to be a part of the show. As we just did with a comment from Facebook, we take your comments, we take your questions, we'll implement them into the show when we get a chance. So you, the best way to do that is to connect with us on Twitter at Locked on Nittany or over on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Locked on Nittany. I'm Kevin McGuire. You can give me a follow on Twitter as well, at Kevin on CFB. And you can check out my national coverage on athlonsports.com and NBCSports.com's college football talk. Until next time, everybody, have a great Tuesday. Enjoy the basketball game tonight if you're getting a chance to go to it or if you're just going to watch it on TV like I probably will. We'll react to it in our next episode as well. And that's it. Have a great day. I'll talk to you again very soon.